Welcome to the Philanthropeneur Show, hosted by Dr. Victoria Boyd, designed to offer tips, strategies, and insight to empower nonprofits and entrepreneurs with sustainable win-win solutions. The Philanthropeneur Show is sponsored by the Philanthropeneur Foundation, building capacity through education and professional services. Well, once again, welcome to the Philanthropeneur Radio Show, and this is Dr. Victoria Boyd, president and founder of the Philanthropeneur Foundation and editor of the Philanthropeneur Journal. And as always, I'm thrilled to bring tips, strategies, and insight for the business and nonprofit sectors. Uh, the, The Philanthropeneur Foundation focus is to build capacity, and very often the work we do is with individuals or within nonprofit organizations. And what we're finding is that it really comes down to strengthening the leadership capacity. Um, And also in this research and just talking to people, I'm getting such a variety of definitions of leadership, what their role should be. And so today I I really think um, we need to clarify what does that mean? And it's been really interesting with all of this research, and it's affirming some of the beliefs I've had all along that nonprofit leader, leaders, they're really a rare breed. They have to come with that passion and purpose, but then they also need to learn at a completely different skill set because uh, there's so many facets of it that are not included in the for-profit sector. And just because you might be an outstanding business leader, those skills aren't always transferable in terms of what is required in the nonprofit sector. So it made me realize that not only do personal leadership skills need to be addressed, but also a real clarification of the attributes of a nonprofit leader. Plus, their roles and responsibility. So, and I like to use the term, whose ball is it? You know, and that might be in the title of a book that I have coming out. I don't know. Let's think about that. Okay. Okay. So we have a monster of a topic here and it might take us two shows to cover all the information, but as usual, I have joining us the, yeah, I'm gonna call her the nonprofit industry expert. And, of course, it's none other than Linda Lysakowski, uh, Advanced Certified Fundraising Executive. And we're going to discuss, explain, and clarify a variety of topics related to leadership issues. And we'll be right back with Linda right after this break. The Philanthropeneur Foundation. Build your capacity with our educational programs and professional services. Learn how to be a philanthropeneur. Maximize your social impact and maximize your revenue. Visit thephilanthropeneur.com or philanthropeneurfoundation.org to find services, resources, and training to launch, enhance, or improve your business or nonprofit strategy. While there, sign up to receive the Philanthropeneur Journal digital publication. All righty then. Welcome, Linda. <laughs> and I don't think we really need to in- introduce Linda. She, I mean, she's almost a regular on the show. Plus, you know, a great friend, and, and I respect her immensely, as so many others do. But just a few notables. She is one of just over 100 professionals worldwide to hold the Advanced Certified Fundraising Executive designation. She's a prolific writer with over 16 books and masses amounts of articles to her credit. She has trained more than 20,000, I I bet that number is even higher now, professionals globally during her, her 30 years in the profession. A recipient of numerous awards, she currently is acquisition editors for Charity Channel and Genius Press and continues to provide training and is a column writer for the Philanthropy Journal. Okay, let's get started. Oh, well, no, first, welcome, Linda. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing fine. How are you? <laughs> it's early here. I know we, we started this show early, but most of our listeners come and listen to the archives anyway. But, I, you know, I wanted to make sure that we could uh, get you on the show today to to discuss these important issues because as I'm going through this research, 
I'm just finding so much what I call conflicting information, and I, I hope that we can clarify some things uh, today. So first, let's start defining what we will be discussing today. Um, I know you and I have had this discussion, but I personally view nonprofit leadership on two different levels. There's the board and then administrative. And so today we're going to focus on the board level. We're going to look at that hierarchy, uh, that what is board membership, the board of directors of a nonprofit. And the reason I want to make this distinction clear is because in some of the literature that I've read, they refer to an executive director managing their board or managing up. Uh, I think that's where a real disconnect comes into play as to the roles and responsibility. What do you think about this whole executive director managing their board? I think that's an interesting concept as well. And, you know, I'm kind of glad that you mentioned before we get into too much about the board, I, I think it's really interesting to note you and I have obviously been in this profession probably more, the, more years than we care to admit. <laughs> But right. I don't know if you felt about this, but when, when you talk about, about the leadership being on both the administrative side and the governance side, I think it's really interesting. When I entered this field, there was very little, if any, training for people entering the nonprofit world as administrators, CEOs, and, and they kind of, most of them, seemed like they just sort of fell into their jobs. Uh, my first job as a development officer I fell into, I was volunteering for my university and the next thing I knew I was giving them a lot of advice as a volunteer and they said why don't you come and work for us <laughs> so I ended up being assistant <laughs> vice president for institutional advancement not having ever worked in the nonprofit sector and there really was no way to learn except on the job um, today I think on the administrative side we have a lot more options as far as training you can get uh, advanced degrees, undergraduate degrees, certificates in nonprofit management, and there's so much more available now for the CEOs that are coming up. So I really think the future of our CEO leadership is is seeing a a big surge in management expertise that they didn't have before because people fell into executive director jobs just like I fell into my director of development job. I was volunteering, and, and oftentimes CEOs came from, they were a board member, and all of a sudden the CEO left, so a board member stepped in and took that place with no training at all. Or they right. were a social worker or a teacher or a minister or something, and they just kind of fell into running executive director. So I think it's great that we have so much more available now on that side of the coin but unfortunately, we still don't have much available to actually train board members. And I know you're going to tell them a little bit more about some exciting things coming up in that regard. But I think most board members fall into their jobs even more so than the administrators do because somebody says, well, we need a new board member. Would you like to serve? And, and the next thing you know, they're on a board and they've had no training no expertise, they don't understand the role of a board. And so it's hard when you have board members like that for the board to govern the organization. So it does fall sometimes to the CEOs, and so they are managing their boards, but I don't think that's the way it should be. I think it's the way it is just because of happenstance. You know, the there's right. board members are coming in here with no leadership skills, so the CEO takes over, and I've sat in board meetings where you would think the CEO was the chair of the board because they were leading all the board meetings. The board members just sat there, oh, okay, yeah, sure, that rubber <laughs> stamped everything the executive director brings to the table. So I think there's there's a real crisis in board leadership that we're dealing with. And, and I glad, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, you, you've seen where uh, executive directors are actually running the board meetings. And, and so, so just looking at uh, the, I'll, I'll call it the hierarchy again, and many people don't like that, because you do need to build a 
consensus and also a really strong working relationship between the executive director and the board of directors. But technically, the board of directors is on the top of that pyramid in terms of a flow chart of the organization. And their role and responsibility is to hire and manage the executive director. But in reverse, the executive director in their roles and responsibilities are charged with making sure that the board is informed and up to date of all of the internal operation systems, programming, and everything that they are charged to implement based on what the board has, you know, defined as the mission and goals and strategies. And they work together, but like you said, too often the executive director takes on the what I, the ultimate leadership role versus one of the supply chains in a hierarchy or in a system of management. And that's where I think that's where a disconnect comes in because often the boards of directors will then delegate or just say, oh, well, they'll do it because that's what their job is. And they really put some of their own roles and responsibilities onto the plate of the executive director, which shouldn't happen. So I'm glad that you and I are going to be uh, really uh, diving, not real deep today, but we're going to hit some key issues today on the board level of responsibility. Uh, um, because I, I think, as you say, there's not a lot of training out there for board members. So uh, need to make them aware of maybe what they're missing. <laughs> like I said, yeah, we're going right. to fill in some of the gaps so they go, uh-oh, I don't know that, or, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. <laughs> so, you know, um, and and we're real familiar with it because we talk about it all the time. We do training all, all the time. So let's, let's, let's sort of look at a board of directors um, and what they're really responsible for. Um, off the top of your head, what would you list as the top things that they should really be focusing on? Well, I think the, the, one of the things is understanding the difference between governance and management. I think that's a big issue with a lot of boards because, I, you know, I mentioned the boards who sit and rubber stamp everything the executive director does because the executive director is acting as a leader. On the opposite side of that coin, you have other boards and sometimes individual board members who don't understand the role of governance. So they think their role is managing the organization. They think they have to be involved in every new hire, every, every evaluation for every staff member, and they have to get in their hands into the program areas. And, and you know, their or, their role is really to oversee these things. They're responsible for making sure the organization has a good strategic plan, a vision, a mission, and that they're following that mission. But their role isn't to decide what color stationery should be used and, you know, what font should be used in the newsletter and all those little minutia things. And sometimes I think you have board members who really don't understand the difference and they think their role this, I think, happens especially with small organizations that when they get started, they can't afford to hire any staff at all, so the board is running the organization. But then when the organization grows and hires an executive director, sometimes these boards have a lot of trouble letting go of that responsibility because mm -hmm. of the way they were raised. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and and there are many smaller nonprofits where the board – and, and I'm going to keep saying transitions into that management role, but still, if they are making the, that step across that bridge, that they have to know that when when they're on that side, they're doing certain things, but when they're on the board side, that they have to keep the two almost uh, separate in terms of what they do. Uh, I've even had a client call me upset that she was trying to – purchased something that was like $90. And she said, well, I have to go through the board to get approval. I'm like, oh. what? <laughs> what do you mean you have to go oh, through the board goodness. to get approval for a, a, an administrative, you know, like something that you need 
today in order to operate, you know, and function with your duties. I said, that's micromanaging or, you know, things like that. Uh, uh, they're, they're, that's where the whole understanding the difference of even what is micromanaging, what is stepping across and putting too much emphasis on operations versus governance. Um, right. So really, I mean, in that governance realm, as you said, you know, it's to ensure the nonprofit completes a strategic and organizational planning and develops policies. Sometimes that even gets confused because the executive director can, can can create job descriptions for all of those uh, different areas underneath there in the management and administration side. The board really only needs to create a job description for the executive director. That's the only right. one they and really that's need really to. That's really the only be, person they should be kind of managing, if you want to call it that word, because right. they really shouldn't be involved. They hire an executive director and then they don't want to let that person do his or her job because it's, you know, they think they have to be involved in every hire and managing people and deciding who should fill the role. And that's really up to the executive director to build their team. And I think it comes a lot of times from a lack of trust. Either maybe the executive directors haven't exhibited that they can be trusted or the board is just reluctant to turn over the reins and so they don't put any trust in the executive director and sometimes I think that maybe they've just hired the wrong person if they yeah. want to really lead they need to hire an executive director who they have faith in that they understand that person's capabilities and that they're willing to let go um, and you know as uh, acquisitions editor for Charity Channel Press I kind of am privy to some books that are coming out that, that haven't been even written yet but one of my favorite authors that I work with a lot is Simone Joyeau, and she she wrote Firing Lousy Board Members. And, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, my gosh, that's, I can't fire my board members. But she has a, another book coming out talking about committee structure. And one of the things that she says, and I have totally agree with her, is that there's no reason to have a program committee on the board because the program, if you right. hire the right people to run your programs, you don't need to have board members involved in how programs are handled. In the strategic planning process, they should be looking at well, what kind of programs are appropriate for our organization and what does our community right. need and are we filling those needs. But they don't need to be hands-on involved with program issues and decide, you know, whether this program should operate from 8 to 4 or 9 to 5 and those right. kind of things. Absolutely not, not really up to governing board members. And that's I mentioned on several shows ago that uh, the Philanthropy Foundation we don't have all of those different types of committees. We're on what is called a three-tier structure. We have an internal committee that deals with HR uh, or uh, just the executive. Um, do we need to hire a um, auditor or a, an accountant for you know the big? Uh, financial accounts, you know, for the 990 and things like that. We have an external one that looks at, you know, how are we dealing with the community? Are are our programs being effective? Also, marketing and PR, because we don't have staff per se for that, it, it will look at how can they support it there. But uh, external would also be their fundraising efforts, you know, mm -hmm. helping them do their what their responsibilities and then we have a governance committee that just looks at you know uh are we uh, doing the job effectively uh, assessing um how are we getting new board members on how are we vetting them what type of board members do we need and those are the only three committees that we even deal with um and it really simplifies and takes the micromanaging element out out of it um and, and so it, it's interesting, uh, the different aspects of how you can look at things like that. Uh, it is, and and you, know, you mentioned that. I'm ahead. intrigued by that last committee because I think that's, to me, the most important committee on any board. And so few boards even have a governance committee. And so that's what's wrong with 
a lot of these boards is that they they don't have any process in place to evaluate their own work. They all know that oh yeah, it's, we have to evaluate the executive director once a year and and you know evaluate his or her work and determine whether or not he or she deserves a raise or whether he or she should stay here or should we fire them. But they don't look at themselves. They don't look at their own actions as a board and realizing that they need to have some kind of a process in place to evaluate themselves and their own work as a board. And I think that's, to me, if you could only have one committee on a board, that's the committee I would have because that is the future of your board. And if you don't have somebody in place that can manage that and, and really look at evaluating the board as a whole and even evaluating individual board members. Sometimes you do need to fire a board member. Um, yeah, we have a caller. Let, let's, yeah, let's see who's uh, calling in here. Oh, okay. Good morning. Who do, we have on, who do we have on the line here? It's Pat Landaker. How are you all? Hi. Hello, Good. Pat. How are you doing? Thank you I'm for doing calling great. in. Well, I think I was, uh, and, and I, I want to introduce Pat. Pat is uh, actually we're actually we're going to do a big announcement. Uh, she's going to be joining the Philanthropy Radio Show in September as the co-host. Yeah, so you know we, we can expand what we're doing here. Pat, just give us a little bit of your background uh, and and tell us, uh, or if you have a question, go ahead and ask a question or a comment. <laughs> Well, uh, one thing I want to say is I have been on a lot of boards. I've been on the the, the high end boards, the the nonprofit, the grassroots, the everything, and so I've seen a lot of different board service governance members and everything. And and I think uh, I'm listening to this on my iPad, and so I think that you guys have probably moved past my, what my question is about. But I wanted to ask, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times, how do you handle board members? because uh, I've seen this be an issue so many times, who really almost fund the the nonprofit, and they feel they have the right to just come in there and talk directly to the employees, directly to the executive director, and, and, and threaten to pull their money because it's not flowing the way they want. And I'm really curious how you guys, uh, what, what's your recommendation for handling those types of situations? Do you want me to take Linda, that you first? Want to speak? Sure. <laughs> well, yeah, you take you it know, first. <laughs> I think one of the dangers of this is, um, and it's it goes back beyond um, even what you're asking, and that is for an organization to become so dependent on one funding source that they're almost afraid to do anything to upset that funding source. And it could be a board member or it could be a foundation, it could be a corporation or it could be just an individual donor. So I think that's really dangerous. Um, one of the things that we need to do, and we're not talking about fundraising the smart way in this program, but um, fall when you come to the Philanthropreneur Impact Conference, we'll be talking more about this. But I think you've got to qualify your donors and look for danger signs. And to me, that's a huge danger sign if a any donor or a board member or someone else says, well, I'm going to pull my money if things don't go my way. I, I know it's really hard for an organization to say, well, no thanks, but thanks, but no thanks. We don't want your money in the first place. Uh, but for some organizations, if they've already gotten themselves into that situation, I think what they need to do is, is explain to the board member that that's not what being a donor means. Philanthropy is giving your your money to an organization, trusting that that organization is going to use it wisely, but not that you can threaten that organization and have strings attached to your donation, because that's not really ethical for a donor yes. to give money that way, and it's not really ethical for an organization to survive that way. I mean, you could have a donor come in there and threaten you with all sorts of, well, you better start this program, or you better hire my niece and my nephew to run the organization. So I don't think you ever want to get yourself into a situation like that. If you are in it, I would really have a serious sit-down with that board member and explain some of this to them. And if they choose to take their money away, then 
you know, it, it really reflects badly on them because they're really being a bully, basically. I think that's, yes. <laughs> that's really hard to, to do. But I think it's, it's tough for an organization to say no to sometimes to donors. But there are some times when you just have to say, no, we don't want your gift. Well, that's and also, it is, true. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's an ethical thing. But also, if you have, uh, and we're talking about governance, if you've created a donor guidelines and policy uh, uh, structures, uh, you know, where you list uh, donor, their impact, you know, on what they give, that they don't have any say. Uh, it, it's it's just with the con- even with the conflict of interest uh, guidelines for board of directors, they can't uh, give money and then dictate how it's spent or things like, or, you know, say uh, that. But also taking it to a whole other system and operations. What is your fund development plan? And you mentioned, you know, if you're reliant on one donor that is going to make or break whether or not you're uh, organization exists or is sustainable, then you really n- need to look at your fund development plan and what are your other revenue streams because not there should not be one funding source that will make or break you, uh, and especially if that funding is bringing a negative impact. And so, you know, I teach responsible fundraising, which deals with that, but also just strategic development of having multiple ways of bringing more funding. And if you see that is happening, you really need to take a long and really start putting into place, okay, how are we going to replace that money? What what funding can we bring in that we don't need that money? Because th- that's like having your hands tied, you know, you, um, and, and it, you need to look long-term on really how to um, – Break that connection with that donor and the organization. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> um. Well, it, it, it does, and I know that you all at the Board Brown Leadership, you'll discuss that because, you know, when you're a brand-new grassroots nonprofit, you are going to take, especially if a big name is giving it to you, you're going to take that. And so I know you guys will cover that whole topic at the um, – at the conference, and, and that's good. I did have one other, <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of times on boards, <clears throat> you have board members, excuse me, board members who <clears throat> come in and they're completely disengaged. And for me, that's always been frust- frustrating because I've always been a roll-up-my-sleeves board member, probably to my own detriment, but, um, <laughs> you know, and, and they, they come in and they're so disengaged and, and you want their name on the board and they want their name on the board because maybe it's a good corporate thing for their company or whatever. But um, how, how does a nonprofit deal with a board member who is pretty much lame duck figurehead? How do they get them to engage more? And why do you think they, they come in and they become instantly disengaged? I, I think a lot of that goes back to that governance committee that Victoria mentioned. Is part of their, a big part of their job is identifying people to serve on the board, and at the same time identifying their commitment. I think so many boards get hung up on this. Well, we have to have the big name board members. We have to have those, all the CEOs on board because then people will give us money. But I don't care how big a name and how deep a pocket this donor has, if they're not committed to the mission of your organization and willing to get engaged, you might as well not have them on your board. Maybe you can put them on some kind of a an advisory committee that only meets once a year or something and, and just gives you advice periodically. But I think we make the mistake of trying to recruit board members for their name or for their money or for their contacts instead of looking at in addition to those things, do they really believe in the mission of what you're doing? Are they really willing to be an advocate for your organization? Because once you get them engaged, then things start really happening. And You can tell the difference when you go to a board meeting. First of all, some of those disengaged people usually never show up at board meetings at all. Um, and you know, If they're on the board for a year and they've been to one board meeting, they're not really in tune with what's going on. 
So I think a lot of this starts in the recruitment process, and we need to nip it in the bud there rather than try to figure out how to get rid of them once they're already on the board. Um, but frankly, if they're on the board and they're not engaged, they're not serving on any committee, they're not attending your events and activities, they're not you know, speaking out on behalf, they're not contributing financially, they're not encouraging others to contribute financially, then I think it's time to have a sit down with them. And this is where your governance committee can come in. Um, it doesn't always have to fall to the executive director, but the governance committee can sit down with them and say, you know, we noticed that you're really not engaged in the organization. Maybe this was a bad choice for you. And, you know, we'd like to let you out of this gracefully if you'd like to resign. Um, we're happy to take your resignation, and maybe we can move you to some some other position. Maybe you can volunteer for something. That's a better fit. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 often I tell uh, when when you're even vetting or you know once a year, I like to put out on the table what are your interests, where do you see, uh, and what excites you. Where where do you want to provide service? Instead of uh, just saying, here's what we have to do, who's going to jump on these, you know, ask them, what is your specialty, what what really excites you, What do you where do you see you bring a value to the board, and how do you see that fit, and, and what, what do you want to do, you know, with that. Ask them what they want to do versus uh, which many boards do. They just say, here's what has to be done. Okay, who who's going to take it on, you know. Um, and and I, I I get greater response not telling them what I need so much uh, on on our board, but asking okay, what is your specialty? What do you like to do? What do, where do you think you can contribute? And so it taps into their interest immediately. Right. But I, think that I, is I loved so it. Critical, yeah. Yeah, I, and, I and, had and, some examples of go ahead. things. I used to be a banker before I was in the nonprofit world. And every time I was asked to serve on the board, without asking, they immediately assigned me to the finance committee. Well, it turned out I worked in the marketing department of the bank. I wasn't the least bit interested in serving on a finance committee. And I have a friend in a similar situation. He's he's an architect. And I was once working with an organization, and I said, you know, boy, I think you'd, you'd be a great member to serve on our board. Do you mind if I pass your name along to our uh, governance committee to consider you for board membership and he said I'd love to but he said I want to tell you right now I do not want to be on the find the facilities committee because he said everybody <laughs> that invites me on a board puts me on the facilities committee because I'm an architect and this happened to be a museum he said what I really would be interested in is your collection he said I love art and so that he was asked to serve on the board and to chair the collection management committee, and he ended up being a wonderful board member. He did donate a lot of architectural services when the time came <laughs> to need those, but he wasn't forced into something. And we make these presumptions, well, if somebody's a banker, sure, they're going to be a great member of our finance committee, but maybe they're really interested in music and they'd rather serve on a, a committee that chooses the symphonies programs for the year or something. So I think it's really Absolutely. important to ask those questions. I think you hit it right on the head there, Victoria. Ask people what their interests are. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to take a real quick commercial break right now, and then we're going to be back, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about leadership aspects. The Philanthropeneur Journal, a quarterly digital publication reaching over 600,000 entrepreneurs and nonprofits get targeted exposure to reach your ideal customer with our unique Ads for a Cause, where 50% of the fee goes to support our nonprofit training and services programs. Together, we can make a difference, create impact, and build capacity. Visit thephilanthropeneur.com, marketing ads tab for all the details. Mention this show and get a 10% discount. Today's Philanthropreneur Show Tip. Okay, today's Philanthropreneur Show Tip is going to be totally self-serving, but it really ties into what we're talking about today. Here at the Philanthropreneur Foundation, our focus is education and training, and what we have coming up is called Board 
Outbound Leadership Training. It's a certificate program that will give you the elements of leadership, governance, uh, uh, fundraising, and assessment. Those are the four key areas that nonprofit boards need to be effective and help their organization. You will be an asset to any organization. And what we're offering today, it's a, really a good show tip, is a coupon code. And if you go to uh, BoardBound816, that's for August uh, the year 16, so BoardBound816.eventbrite.com, and you enter the coupon code BB50, you'll get 50% off a of registration. Now, this training is August 12th and 13th, two full days with Linda Lysakowski and myself as the trainers and facilitators. You will walk away with a full toolkit of information. You will have a full list of resources and access to that. Plus, I'm offering a follow-up webinars uh, over the course of six weeks, uh, a 50-some minute webinar to ask questions that you might have afterwards. Great, great value there. So visit boardbound816.eventbrite, and that's B-R-I-T-E dot com, for, and use the coupon code BB50. Also, don't forget October 20th through 22nd, Impact Learning. Uh, the early bird registration is open right now. You can find all of the information for both of these on our website, philanthropynerfoundation.org, or at Eventbrite for Impact Learning. That's 2016 Impact Learning Eventbrite. I know that was a lot of information, but now let's get right back to our show. Okay. We're here with Linda Lysakowski. We also have Pat Landecker on the uh, line here with us, two leading, outstanding leaders um, in both leadership and the uh, – Linda is with – Charity Channel and many organizations. Uh, Pat is actually running her own brand new uh, nonprofit organization called the Ruby Red Slippers Project. So we're, we have some great minds here. Uh, oh, I'm bragging, yes, uh, to talk about leadership. And one of the definitions that many people don't understand is what is an emerging leader in the nonprofit sector. And just real quickly, because I wrote a blog on it just a few days ago. Many people associate the word emerging with someone that's young and new and, and just entering or coming into their career. But in the nonprofit sector, which you will start hearing over and over again, we have different definitions and different terms. That an emerging leader is basically anyone. It's multi-generational, but it's anyone that is just entering the sector. It could be a new young, aspiring um, person coming in and building their career. But it also could be the founder that is just, you know, they had their long career in something else, but they want to start a nonprofit. And so they're an emerging leader. They have to learn those uh, different um, aspects and attributes unique to nonprofit leadership. But also it might be the long-term experienced business person that has been in, this, in a sector and a career, and they're transitioning into a board role or, you know, now have time to go into um, being more uh, of a leadership uh, role in the nonprofit, but they're emerging because they also need to learn what it is about nonprofits. So putting, just throwing the question out to either one of you. Have you found certain aspects of this emerging leader that you might feel is important to point out? Throw it um, out there. This is Linda. I, get, I think what I okay. I like your description of an emerging leader because a lot of times it's not just a young person entering the field. It is someone who spent a long time in their business career and now they really want to give back, and I think we're finding more and more of this, um, which is one of the exciting things, I think, about the the Gen Xers and the baby boomers and, the, you know, all the mm -hmm. different levels, that people aren't just working to become rich so they can retire and live on a private island somewhere. They're working because <laughs> they want to give back to the world, and I see so much of this happening 
But I, I think to me there's two important facets of this, and they might sound contradictory. One is that people who have had a successful career, and I think we see this all the time in the nonprofit sector, we get these big business leaders to serve on our board, and then they come to a board meeting, and it's like, did they check their brain along with their hat at the door? Because <laughs> why, they were suggesting things that they would never do in a successful business, but they think the nonprofit world is so different. So I think part of it is, um, you know, using that expertise that you have and starting to think about a nonprofit even though there's a lot of unique things about the nonprofit sector, to start to think of it more like a business world environment because sometimes we think nonprofits have to pay all their employees peanuts and they have to – we always are saying we do more with less. Well, I'd like to really start a revolution where we're not always thinking about how great our overhead is and, oh, boy, we keep our administrative fees down really low. I think one of the things that board members need to ask themselves is not are we spending too much money, but they need to turn that question around and say, are we investing enough money into this organization to make it grow and to make it viable? So I think that's one thing these emerging leaders need to bring. But on the other side of that coin, they do need to understand that the nonprofit world is different in some ways and that some of the language is going to be different. When I went from 11 years in banking into the nonprofit sector, I felt like I really had a big uh, asset in the fact that I had a lot of business knowledge and I worked with business development and marketing, and I lent that to the nonprofit sector. But on the other side of the coin, at the same time, I realized I didn't know a whole lot about the nonprofit world, so I immersed myself in reading all sorts of books and magazines and going to conferences and webinars. And Well, at that time we didn't have webinars. <laughs> I was going to conferences <laughs> and seminars and workshops and I, because I knew I needed to learn a lot. And I went to the first – I started my job in July and went to a a case conference, and they started talking about light bunts and side bunts, and I thought, what in the heck are they talking about? They have their own language. <laughs> so it, I think that emerging leaders need to tap into kind of both sides of their brain and look at, here's my business brain. What can I bring to the nonprofit from my business experience? But at the same time, what can I learn from the nonprofit sector? So I think if you, if you have uh, that fine line and, and can focus on both of those, you're going to be a leader in this organization. Um, Absolutely. You know, I do agree um, uh, with Linda in terms of it has nothing to do with your age or your profession. I think that a lot of uh, an emerging leader doesn't even realize there's a leader within them, and they're probably discovering that through a, a variety of ways. You know, um, I have a friend who just took over a leadership role actually at Zappos, um, and she realized, well, they realized really that she had an informal influence over a lot of the employees. And as Zappos was going through some changes, she was tapped, and she was surprised to be tapped, and everyone had seen the leadership within her that she never saw. And, you know, I think a lot of times uh, that's how uh, leaders emerge is they don't even know. You know, it's somebody else has seen it, their leadership skill or their inherent leadership skills, and and they um, ask them to, to help direct others. I think that a lot of emerging leaders are directed by core values, and I think that's a, a definite distinction with uh, emerging leaders. And um, I think that they want to become a leader, but they don't know how. And so emerging leadership is a, kind of a realization of a, a, a capability um, that's discovered probably in some awkward fashion in most ways, unless you're with somebody, a company, or, or someone who uh, identifies it for you. And I think I've seen a couple of... Uh, emerged leaders who are really surprised uh, that they've had that, you know, it's kind of like my, my 
Ruby Red Slippers program. You know, they click their heels three times. They realize, oh, I've been a leader all along, you know. Um, so that's right. kind of how I see emerging uh, leaders and leadership. Right. And and just, just know that, you know, in our context, we're always bringing it back to the nonprofit sector because I see, you know, in this emerging, like you said, some people don't even realize they have that leadership uh, because I deal a lot with the individuals, the founders that are launching a nonprofit, and they they come with just the passion for their cause. But then they have to step into that leadership role if, you know, they're going to maintain uh, a, a prominent uh, position in the organization. There are some founders who just come up with a concept and then get their board and, and hire the executive director and just sort of uh, stay as that founder emeritus, you know, designation. But most of them want that leadership role. And so in the nonprofit sector, uh, they have to understand how it's different. Uh, we mentioned coming from the business terms uh, sector and then coming in. They have to learn that there is a whole new different way of measurement for success, that it's not about always the money. It's not about operation cost and things. It's how you use the money. What impact are you having? And, and then just taking it a little bit step further into just the de defining leadership, the difference between whether you're a servant or a steward leader. You know, at first, many years ago, I was like, oh, you, you have to be a servant leader. But, but servant is, you know, you, you give and, 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 don't really uh you you are there as the servant but a steward leadership is you understand the aspect of being a servant leader but then you understand that you're there to help steward guide lead the organization and make it stronger and that's why the whole concept which we'll be covering in board bound uh leadership is the whole concept of intentional leadership that you take the elements of servant leader, serving others, you combine it with that steward that you're there to lead, but also you do it with intention of what I call sustainability or your succession plan, which many, uh, the whole for-profit sector, often they don't even deal with succession. You get fired and you hire somebody else, or, you know, but in the nonprofit to to create a platform or foundation for sustainability, you have to look at what is that succession that would come under your governance? How are you putting new board members on? What are the terms? How are, you know, ro rotation out? What, do, what are your needs? But also as a leader, that intentional aspect is, are you building the next generation of leaders? And I like to you know, say that you're living your legacy versus leaving a legacy. And so you're in your realm, you're, you're building uh, the next generation of leaders around you. And it, it's so, you know, it can be very, you know, uh, complicated, and we, won't, we don't have time to get into all of that here. But it, it's, it's an interesting concept because many boards – and, and maybe you can respond to this, actually uh, don't take on the full realm of the leadership aspect of what they should be doing for not only the internal organization, but the longevity and sustainability of the organization. Any thoughts on, I know I've been rambling on, <laughs> of any of, of, for board growth and individual growth? Well, I love the concept of the steward leader um, because I think that's really what a board member is. In, in a one word to sum it up, is there is a steward. There, a nonprofit organization is really a public trust. It's something that nobody owns. Nobody's getting the benefits of the corporation like you would if you were starting your own for-profit business, but you're there to steward that organization, to serve the community, and that's really, I think if board members understand that one concept, it would make a, a huge turnaround in the way they do business, that they want that organization to be, as he said, sustainable and, and be around for the future, and not just for their term on the board, whether it's two years or three years or six years or whatever, that they want to make sure that this organization is viable, that they're investing 
the money in it wisely that they're not only just looking at every dollar spent but every dollar that comes in too and making sure that the organization has a sustainable plan. I think Pat said earlier about, you know, organizations where a, a board member is maybe the only donor that this organization has or one of the biggest donors. And you don't want that because it's not sustain, sustainable. That or board member is mm-hmm. going to die, they're going to move, they're going to get ticked <laughs> off with the organization, whatever. So I think that's a big a big word, steward. I love that. I just love that terminology. And I think if board members thought of themselves more as a steward, we would be much stronger in the nonprofit sector. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, yeah. Linda, I think, too, that in steward leadership, a large part of that, and I see it lacking in, in a lot of boards, is a clear understanding of who their constituents are. Board exactly. members come in and they really don't even know who they are serving, and they really need to understand who their public is in order to understand how to lead the organization so it serves that public well. Right. And that's that's one of the unique aspects of nonprofits because they actually have two sets of constituents. They have the the clients or the who they serve under their programs, what their focus, their mission is. But also they have their donors and the community that they have to answer to. And so they almost have to have two different um, sets of, of or paths of what their language is and, and how they are stewarding. They, they need to steward their donors and they need to steward their program and the organization itself. And in... in uh, I talk about that in some of our marketing classes because they don't understand. Well, you need two messages, don't you? That what you promote in your programming is not what you'll promote for someone to uh, to support you. And and yeah, that, I, I've been using the word st- steward leadership and intentional leadership to it really helps me get across the difference in nonprofit leadership governance fundraising, and even the assessment value um, or data metrics because all of those are different, take on unique aspects uh, in the nonprofit sector. Any uh, any other comments on all of this emerging leaders and uh, the, the aspects of board of directors um, leadership capacity, I'll call it that. All righty then. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> nicely. <laughs> okay, I think we, I think we sort of. I mean, we starting out with the show. I wanted to define and clarify the difference between board leadership, executive director. I think we clarified that that it's two different threads. It's two different hierarchies, uh, two different roles and missions that you really need to to um, understand and clarify, and that can be done with. Um, roles and responsibility policies written out. Uh, it can be done with job descriptions written out. Uh, and a lot of this is covered in the roles and responsibilities of the board of directors. So just understanding and clarifying where's that double yellow line, where's there a crossover, where, you know, where do we turn the corner will be very effective for Everyone who is involved in the nonprofit uh, sector, and so this will, now I'm just talk, talking about the board bound leadership. Once again, it's August 12th and 13th. We will be covering all of these aspects, and the reason we're making this a, a certificate program is because, as both Pat and Linda have mentioned throughout the show, they have seen where. Boards just aren't getting it. They're just not uh, understanding what their role is. And it will help, as Pat was mentioning, how do you, you know, get these board members that uh, are vetted, you know, or, or give their money and think they can control things. But this will help new nonprofits or those that are looking to enhance or build capacity of the board. All boards are always looking for new members, but if they start asking the question, are you board bound certified? It will give them a level of sort of of assurance that 
at least that board member has a certain level of understanding of the sector. And I think that's, that's a movement that we all, you know, would love to see that, you know, by saying you're board bound certified that we can guarantee that they have a, a level of knowledge and uh, understanding of how to take any organization to the next level. Okay, as we're getting ready to close out here, do, uh, Pat, do you have any final statement to make? Well, Give us a, a – Go ahead. Just on what you just said, Victoria, I know that when we were looking at board members, I, I would have loved to have them come with some certification of basic board knowledge. I think this program, Board Bound Leadership, is just something that should have happened a long time ago, and I'm happy, I'm happy <laughs> it's happening now. And I know it's going to be uh, its so consummate the way that you've put it together and you and Linda are just amazing and dynamite, and I would hate for anybody to miss out on an opportunity to really get down and dirty with nonprofit board leadership. I think it's amazing, <laughs> and I thank you for putting it together, and everybody needs to be involved. Oh, thank you so much. Linda, any final words? Just, you know, I, I think using the word intentional leadership is really good. Uh, another book that's coming out very shortly by Kent Stroman, another one of my famous authors, is The Intentional Board. And on the book cover, uh, which is already designed, he has the accidental board with the word accidental crossed out and then intentional written above it. And I think that message says it all, that if you don't have an intentional board, what you end up with is an accidental board, right. and I don't think any of us want an accident <laughs> waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, sure. Just like in your history, we don't want you just falling into a role because they, they saw right. that you could do when it, you know, and then you, fortunately, you took it upon yourself to really educate yourself by, you know, going and, and learning the sector. Uh, here, you know, with board bound leadership, we can at least know that they have a certain level. I want to thank both of you for coming on the show once again um, uh, on our first show of, the, of September. I think it's September 4th. I'm not sure. Or um, we're going to welcome Pat as a co-host. So make sure you look for that. Uh, Linda, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. You always are a wealth of information. Um, you can find all of Linda's books and things at lindalizakowski.com. Lizakowski, I should say, um, and that's l y s a k o w s k i dot com. And as always, uh, the Philanthropy Mission is building capacity through education and professional services. Please visit our website, philanthropyfoundation.org. You'll see all of our uh, events, the services we do. There's a lot of information. We have some new things coming out. Uh, our journal was just released on the 15th. Make sure you go and look for a copy of that. Um, and I just want to ask, in, in the meantime, before you uh, say goodbye, Tune in next time when we welcome another great guest. But ask yourself, are you a philanthropist? Thank you for tuning in to the Philanthropist Radio Show, hosted by Dr. Victoria Boyd. Get involved. Follow us on Facebook and other social media outlets. If you wish to share comments or suggestions or appear as a guest on our show, visit www.thephilanthropist.com. Contact Victoria Boyd, email her at thboyd at thephilanthropreneur.com. The Philanthropreneur Radio Show is a production of and sponsored by the Philanthropreneur Foundation, a 501c3 tax-deductible organization.